Pride Film Festival. Um, I'm pleased that you've all come out, even with the weather that we said was tonight. Uh, you may have heard our Thanks for thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, because it's hard to start it. I got all the source. Why you have two mics? Kind of, uh, hmm? you know, kind of where your, you know, where your power kind of comes from, and and kind of speaking truth to power, and kind of speaking truth in your art, and and finding your truths in your art, um, and. Um, you know, I, the best way for me to kind of talk about that is probably to tell you kind of how I got started. Uh, before I get started, I got to get a live uh, painting. Just a cat. I mean, I, <laughs> I just said it. He, he just saw. Yeah, I just saw him. So he's going, "Oh man, no one now is he now?" Uh, my my script supervisor, and um, but far more than that, one of the one of the most knowledgeable people in cinema in in the region. Robert Hubbard. Stand up, Robert. <laughs> so the whole thing of of uh, finding your 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 truth and and sharing in your art, uh, I guess first you gotta find some truth. <laughs> you know, right? So you gotta find a little truth. And for me, uh, it started uh, in kind of high school. Uh, and, and growing up in Junction City. I grew up in Junction City, just down the road piece. And Junction City's a unique place. Um, uh, it's kind of like, it has all the, the problems of Topeka, but in a little small town. Uh, and it also has all the good things that Topeka has in a small town, uh, which is, you know, diversity, and, you know, we were, Junction City was diverse before the term diversity existed, you know, and, and, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, it always got dogged out because it was, it was diverse. And um, so growing up in, in a town, it's, a, it's an army town. My parents were not in the army. We actually were from there. Uh, which in Church City, that's kind of a weird thing. Like you're from, you're from Church City. I spoke there a while back, and there was like 1,600 students at our new high school, a big, huge ass high school. And and I just did a little random survey. I said, how many of you are you know are were born in Church City? 1,600 kids. I think like 30 put their hands. <laughs> And, and that's kind of one of the problems of, of that town, um, one of the challenges of the town, uh, is that, you know, people aren't from there. And when you're not from a place, you don't invest as much. You don't really invest in the problems. You don't invest in trying to make things better as much. And so, but when, you, when you're from there, that's your hometown. I mean, every, every place I go, I always talk about Junction City because it had such a big in, in, impression on, on me. And uh, so, Junction City is a crazy place. And it was a crazy place growing up. And my parents were, were different, you know? Uh, my, my mother uh, had run a pool on 9th Street. 9th Street was the red light district in Junction City. And uh, it was, 
like legendary, legendary place. And my father was a construction worker. He was a what's called a hog carrier. Uh, and hog carriers are the guys that carry the mortar to the bricklayer. And, and back in the days that they'd go up and down the ladder all day long, typically is kind of backbreaking work. My father belonged to the hog carrier and common laborers union, which I, I just love that. The common laborers union. And so, uh, so you know, they they were. My father went to the sixth grade. My mother went to the tenth grade. Um, that was, but they were both. You know, my mother especially was very sophisticated, very educated in her own way. She's one. She, when we would watch films, she would kind of tell me who the people were. Uh, and so that was really a great. Thing for me growing up. Actually, I'm, I'm named after Kevin McCarthy from Invasion of the Body Snatchers. <laughs> and she said she was watching a movie one night and Kevin McCarthy was in this film and she said, I think I'll name him Kevin. <laughs> and she told me, yeah, you named after that dude. It's like, okay. I wish that he's, he's passed away and I wish I had had a chance to say, hey man, I'm named after you. It's like, you probably wouldn't have been worried about a maternity suit or something. <laughs> um, so, you know, unique kind of world. My father was 60 when I was born. My father was born in 1898. So my father was an old man when I was a kid. Uh, and so when you, you've got a father that's old and you're a kid, you're surrounded by older people. And, and that was one of the best things that ever happened to me because it taught me about history. It taught me about like, you know, about story. Because I would just, you know, you know how it was in back in the days. You, you couldn't say nothing. They, they let you stay in the room. <laughs> but you better not say nothing, right? <laughs> so so you, you could stay in the room and just listen, maybe. And so I, I heard all these stories about Ninth Street. I heard all these stories about, um, you know, growing up, there growing up. And so it, all those things had a big influence on me growing up. Um, but there was a problem. And the problem was really that um, because I think because Junction City is um, has that thing of no one really kind of being from there, uh, that that people kind of would come and and oppress the folks because no one's from there, so no one's really looking. No one's no one's there to go, hey man, you can't you can't do that. You can't do that to, to them, you know. Uh, and when you're not, when people aren't invested in the community, uh, then oppression really kind of can just freely kind of take place. Kind of what stops oppression is investment in the community, in, in an institution, in whatever. That's what stops, that's what stops oppression. That's what stops kind of power from kind of taking advantage of you. And, uh, and so that wasn't happening there. So the high school I was in, uh, there was a the principal there was just was just racist. Just, there's no other word to say. It. Just do this dude was racist. And and you know those of you who remember you know back in the seventies in, in high school. Seventies uh, is a is a really unique time because things are changing and 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 it's a hip time and uh, and so all of that is is like an assault on power. You know, the power doesn't like change, right? And so, um, so this was happening in the high school and, and I was always one of those guys that, I mean, I, you know, I, I didn't have great grades, but I was, you know, but I, I paid attention a little bit, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, uh, but more than anything, I was interested in what I was interested in. And when I was, and so I was, I was reading stuff that I was, I was kind of educating myself. And because they didn't really teach us anything that I was interested in. So I just educated myself, really. And, uh, and so I had kind of my own thing going, but one of the worst things and one of the best things that kind of could happen to you as a kid is when you kind of, I think it was probably because of you know, being around the older folks, is that I started to kind of develop a sense of seeing things, of seeing 
the same kind of wrong that can take place. You know, when you're a kid, you know when you're a kid and you see somebody being mistreated and you kind of go like, man, that's messed up. And, and, and typically when you're a kid, there's nothing you can do about it, you know? And that's one of the, that's the one of the, so, so it's kind of a gift that you get in terms of kind of, you know, discernment where you can see something, but then you have, you're powerless to do anything about it. And then oftentimes, you know, when no one's invested in, in the community, there's no adult you can go to and say, hey, man, there's a problem over here. So that's kind of what was happening at the high school. And the principal was just kind of running roughshod over people. And, and, and um, so I'm trying to cut to, cut to the chase here. Um, so eventually a riot takes place at the high school. And so I, 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 I just noticed a lot of my movies have riots in them. <laughs> and, and I think it's because I was in a riot. I was in a riot in high school. And I was in this riot, and I wasn't in the riot. I mean, you know, the riot broke, broke. But so what happened was that um, the athletes in school were the only people that were worthy of existence. The black athletes, specifically. So if you're if you're a, if you're a black athlete, you're going to get a pass. We find you doing something wrong, you know, we we're going to give you a pass. But if you're not, if you're black and you're not an athlete, you were you were worthless, basically. And and so I saw guys going down like that, where you know you do something wrong and, and they're just and you know you know it's not like that today when when kids kicked out of school, they often don't come back. You know, and so when when back especially back in the seventies, it's a little better now. But back then, when a kid would, would get kicked out, uh, their life, maybe you would join the army, maybe, if you were lucky, you could join the military. But a lot of times, what was waiting for you in Judge State was the street. The hustle was waiting for you. And so, a lot of these guys went straight to the hustle. And, and so, education was just not even a concept growing up for me. You know, it wasn't even like, you know, go to college. College was, the only people who went to college were guys that played sports. It's the only guys who went to college. And they went to JUCO. They didn't go, they didn't go like KU or K-State. That was just so rare. So all of that was just kind of the way it was. And so this, this one kid uh, gets into a fight with the star white quarterback. And the, the white kid gets thrown out and the white and the quarterback doesn't get thrown at all, and that caused the riot. And so, and what's amazing when when a riot happens is that you know people are like we all are, just normal, we're just normal people. You know, we have a sense of honest. We're not violent. We're not you know hateful. But riots typically happen as tension builds. It doesn't just, it's not just one spark. Tension builds, and it builds, and it builds. And then a spark happens, like this kid not being kicked out. And people have this breaking point. And when they break, then they're not normal anymore. Because kind of when people break, it's like, you know, you see the movies all the time, you know, it's like when, when somebody is being abused in a movie, and, and eventually they they hit this breaking point, and they snap, and they and they end up hurting them, or they kill them, or something horrible happens, right, in the movie, and then and then it's like you've been watching this person, this character, being mistreated the whole movie, and then they snap, and then they, they, they kill the bad guy, but then they're in trouble because you can't kill people, <laughs> you know, right? so that's what happened. And so I, I was on the second floor of the school, and the parking lot is just full of kids beating each other up. That was one of the most insane things I've ever seen in my life, where guys would just look at another guy and just slide. And, and so, you know, like uh, all my friends were kicked out of school, 
and um, and and that pissed me off because I kind of knew. I started to kind of figure out that the principal was the guy who was really kind of behind all of this, who was creating the atmosphere that was making people break. And and all those guys got kicked up, and none of them came back to school. None of them. So I said to myself, well, I, you know, I got to do something. So I was watching the black exploitation movies at this time. Shaft, Superfly. Foxy Brown. And the Call Theater in Junction City, there was a different, there was a new black movie every week back in the 70s. It was, it was the most magnificent thing I've ever had in my life. And you gotta remember, when you were a kid like me, who was, who was a movie freak, my first, my first movie hero was Hercules, Steve Reeves. Anybody remember Steve Reeves? Yeah, I mean, you remember Steve. <laughs> Steve Reeves was a muscle-bound dude, and he went over to Italy and made some bad Italian, we call, they call them sword and sandal movies. And, and so he was a big muscle-bound dude, and, and as a kid, we were watching these, and I was like, man, that is so cool. He'd break these chains, and it was like, wow. <laughs> and then it was, uh, was the man with no name, Clint Eastwood. It's the spaghetti westerns, and you throw that poncho. It's like, oh, that dude is so cool. That's the coolest dude in the world. And then it was James Bond with Sean Connery. Remember how he'd walk out, and then they'd, he'd fire the gun, and, that, and the blood would come down the opening of the movie. That was so cool. And all of us, just a bunch of black biracial kids in a the theater watching the stuff, just eating it up. So when the black exploitation movies hit, when Shaft shows up, oh my God. <laughs> Shaft was like a revelation. Shaft was like, well, now we have a black hero like these other guys that I've been watching my whole life as a kid. There's a black hero, and he's, and he's not just a black hero, he's, he's a black hero. <laughs> I mean, he's black. I mean, it's, uh, the music's black. Isaac Hayes' is music, he was, we called him you know, Black Moses back then. You guys probably know the chef from South Park. You know? <laughs> and so the music was black. The way he spoke was black. The problems he had was black. He had black problems. Um, you know, he was a black hero. He, he wore a leather coat like the brothers did. But he was just the coolest damn thing in the world. And so there's a scene in Shaft where uh, Shaft gets a Molotov cocktail. And he's going to he throw it through the window. It's a very famous song. He's the, the poster for Shaft. He kind of throws his ball top cocktail through the window. And he swings it through the window. And he fires a gun. He kills a bunch of bad guys. And it's just super cool. So I've been writing about this. you know, And, and I was starting to think, I think that Shaft influenced me because I created a Molotov cocktail after the riot. And I got guys together, and we were throwing firecrackers all over the school, pulling fire alarms. We were just disrupting everything, and and we I had this Molotov cocktail, and I I wasn't going to use it, but it, but it but it kind of made it made you feel powerful, like man, like yeah, we're going to do this, man. We were going to do it. <laughs> but but it made it made you feel like yeah, man, and. And so what happened was, you know, I'm in the only class I liked. And it was like a, a, a it was like a new class they just started. It was like a minority history class, like a black history class. And I'm in class, the teachers let me, you know, break it down. I'm talking, yeah, man, and you know, and then the brothers, and then, you know, I'm breaking it down, <laughs> breaking it down. And in comes the principal. And they say, they just take me, they just take me out. And they take me in there. And, and then he has them all top copy. Way starts to us. We went to your locker and we, we found, he said, he's literally said, this is like right out of a movie. He literally says, we finally got you. He says, we finally got you. <laughs> he puts the all top cocktail on the table and he says, we caught your buddies. They gave you up. It's just like a gangster movie or something. You know what I'm saying? It's like, this is something. High school, man. College, high school, man. I'm, like, I'm a little kid. I'm 16 years old. It's like, we finally got you. Okay. Uh, and, and 
So he laughed at my face and never forget that. And then the assistant principal came in and he asked me, do you play sports? And I said, no, I don't. And he walked right out the door. If I had played sports, I would, all that would have been brushed away. So they kicked me out of school. They just kicked me out. They expelled me. Get out and don't come back. And I worked at the cemetery in, in Jersey City. It was a little Catholic cemetery on the thing called the Cedar Program. Anybody remember the Cedar Program? Cedar Program was a, was a, this was back in the days when the government actually wanted kids to work and not, that, you know, get in trouble in the summertime. So you, they, the Cedar Program gave, gave you a job in the summertime. And, and that's how we bought our school clothes, that's how, we, that's how I bought my first car. I saved up from the CEDA program and I bought my first car. And uh, so the CEDA program, I was working at St. Mary Cemetery and one of the guys there was a priest that, you know, that we just, that, you know, helped, that was really our manager for the, for the, for the program. And he got me into the Catholic school uh, and that's uh, and they they pushed me to go to college. A priest by the name of Father Frank Cody, he pushed me to go to college, and and so and then one of the nuns there, she said, uh, because I was I'd been out of school for a long time, and um, and and I uh, you know I got to class, and she said, all you got to do is just read three books, and I'll, I'll pass you. And you can you pick any of these books. And one of the books I picked was Gordon Parks, A Choice of Weapons. And A Choice of Weapons is about how you can take a camera and use it as a weapon to fight back. And that book really kind of made me understand that a, a, the camera is a weapon to fight oppression, to fight injustice, to fight racism, to fight sexism fight homophobia, to fight any of the isms that 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 classism, the, the list is long. And so that's what I that's what I learned to do. That's what I, really what I learned how to do this. Uh, and so I always wanted to tell stories. I was writing stories back then and but after that I knew that I had to tell stories really that were about kind of you know, the other end of America, the other side of America, the, the, the other end of America that, that we don't like to talk about. And, and it's now become obviously very important because people don't want you to tell these stories. Uh, I just recently made a film called 24. <clears throat> and uh, if you want to look up critical race theory, look up critical race theory and there'll be a picture of the 24. That's 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 what that's what the twenty fourth is. The twenty fourth is the history that they don't want taught, the history they don't want you to know. So, how many know about the Houston riot of nineteen seventeen? Some of you guys see the movie. <laughs> uh, usually, when I when I say that, and most people have not heard of it, uh, no one's known. It's the largest murder trial in American history. The largest murder trial in American history. And we were never taught this because it comes out of a riot. It comes out of a riot. And this is 100 years ago, over 100 years ago now. And it might as well, it could have been yesterday. Same issues with the police that you saw after George Floyd was murdered. Same problems 100 years ago. Over 100 years ago, same deal. And so, uh, so I decided to make movies, really, that I think Hollywood doesn't really want made. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I work for hire, I write things that the studios want me to write. The movies I make, the things I do on my own, I try to tell stories that, that they don't want told. That's kind of my criteria, is I try to, I try to tell stories that the system is, I think, ultimately now kind of afraid of. Uh, they don't want you to know your history. American history is 
not very pretty, but guess what? No country in the world has a pretty history. No country in the world has a pretty history. I'll say it one more time. No country in the world has a pretty history. Everyone's history is, is, has genocide fought in it, Native Americans, um, mistreatment of women, mistreatment of gays, mistreatment of slavery, you know, we all know. And when I made the, my film um, Confederate States of America, uh, which is about the South winning the Civil War, which the South did win the Civil War, Obviously, they lost on the battlefield, but they won in this attempt to hold on to their way of life. And this new thing of not wanting you to know the history is kind of the South still kind of rising again. And 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 it's it's beyond the South. It has nothing to do with region now. But it's it's that it's that it's that kind of mentality of not wanting you to really own the history. When, when someone tells you you, you, don't, you shouldn't own, you shouldn't know certain things, that means you don't own it. So that means you don't own American history. That, that, that American history is so, so difficult that it's beyond your capacity to kind of breathe it in. And that's, a, that's an amazing thing when people are trying to tell you that. I mean, you know, Confederate States of America is probably I have to say, because one of the guys that was in the film was fired because he was in the film. You know, I've gotten calls from New York Times, a week in the morning, New York Times, oh, um, you know, they showed your film uh, in a classroom and, uh, and the principal had to apologize to the whole class, to the whole school because they showed your film. And, you know, because it's about American history. So you can, you, can, you can talk about sex. Sex is, sex is not controversial. See, they have, they have naked people rolling around in the bed on daytime TV. <laughs> you know, sex is not controversial. The last thing that we really don't own in the country that, that owns us is really race in so many ways. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to show you the trailer to the 24th. Um, so I was, I was, um, you know, writing a lot of different films, and came across this photograph of of um, the largest murder trial in American history. Uh, uh, so it's sixty three black soldiers um, on trial at one time for murder and mutiny in Houston, Texas, in nineteen seventeen. Uh, basically, the 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 um, uh, the police were brutalizing the 24th Infantry. They sent them to Texas, sent them to Houston to uh, to, to guard the construction of a thing called Camp Logan. And Camp Logan was a thing that was going to train soldiers to go to World War One. So these guys were there, and they're just guarding the camp. But the, every time they go into town, the police would brutalize them, brutalize them, brutalize them, brutalize. Them. And eventually, one of their main guys, a beloved member, they thought was brutalized and killed. And 150 soldiers marched over Houston and went after the police. It's the only riot where more whites died than blacks. Uh, it's probably another one of the reasons why we don't know that story. And uh, so, anyway, let's, uh, let's, I'll have you guys take a look at the trailer here. Man of the 24th Infantry. This is Texas. And we have a great opportunity here. Legacy. You've proven worthy. We'll carry us all the way to the shores of France. Things are a little different down here in the south. I will expect you men to obey the racial code. Yes, sir. Go ahead and drive this machine. Oh, what's the problem? This is a white man's wood. Every man here is out of their fuse. Jim Crow's the law. Respect it. What are we gonna do? The police brutalize us, sir. All we need is to be treated as soldiers. The military police, you are to 
to ensure order of the men of the 24th Infantry only. Dropped in there. So, um, the 24th um, is one of those weeks that Hollywood was never going to make. And so, you have to make those films independently. And when I, when I tell students, I think that you, when you're trying to find your voice, trying to find the thing that, that you, you, that you want to do, that the way you, you want to express yourself in film, when you, when you take on stories that you know are important, but are kind of against the rules of, of exhibition in a way, in a weird way. Uh, it, it, it's one of the ways that you can really gain support for your film. You know, when I made my first film, Ninth Street, I, you know, I had to come back home. It's really one of the reasons why I live here, because I had to come home to Kansas, because no one knew what I was, what I was talking about in New York and in LA. No one knew what I was talking about. So you have to kind of go to where people know your story, understand your stories, and support what you're trying to do. And, and, that's, and that's why, that's really kind of why I'm still here now. Because I, I, you know, I made that choice a long time ago, and, and, and now the choice has worked for me. And if I had not made my independent films on my own, I don't think I'd have an Academy Award. Because if I had gone out there, I wouldn't have had a chance to tell my story. So making my small independent films gave me the ability to get better at what I was doing. You can't become a better filmmaker if you're not making films. And you gotta understand, Hollywood is not in the business of making films. They're in the business of developing films. So you've probably heard of development hell people get a project going and they talk about it for a hundred years and it never gets made that's because people make a living off of development they don't make a living off of making movies what pays their bills every day is development money so they the movie doesn't have to get made the, the movies the movies i mean i'm getting paid every day because we're developing so you have to find a way to get those movies made and you know, fortunately, Spike's kind of like me. You know, he's he's a passionate filmmaker, and so um, you know, he's trying to get those movies made. And so, typically, when I work with him on something, it, it gets made because you know he he's brought in. He's not he's not developing movies. He's finding projects that are in the pipeline to get made, and then we kind of find those projects and rewrite them quite often, and then move them into production. And so the same thing needs to happen when you're a student filmmaker, when you're a young filmmaker, when you're trying to get started. You have to find a way to tell your story. And the more people can relate, understand, invest in your story, then the more support you're gonna get. You need a lot of help when you're making your first films. You gotta have a lot, a lot, a lot of help. And you gotta ask favors from everybody and their brother, and, but more than anything, 
you know, if they don't believe in you, you're not going to get that support. You know, and so you've got to do something that people kind of can care about. And so, so that was that was kind of how I did it. I think you know everybody's got their way. Everybody's got the story they want to tell, the, the things that they're interesting for them. Uh, but the 24th was when I saw the photograph of the, the murder trial. These 64, 63, 64 Buffalo soldiers, um, all these black men, you know, cordoned off. And the trial was in a church, uh, the only place big enough to have the trial. And it had, it had, the captain said, the largest murder trial in American history. I'm going, why? Why have I not heard about this? The large, I mean, America loves murder, right? <laughs> the largest murder trial in America, you think everybody would know that, right? And nothing, zero. And, and even when we made the film, Hollywood was like, oh, good job, yeah. Because, you know, I think you gotta understand Hollywood's a business. And and the business of film is not about trying to make the nation better. It's about making money. And but you can make the nation better and make some money too. Amen. <laughs> so so uh, so that's kind of where it started for me. You know, was um, really kind of trying to tell stories. I went to college at Salina, Kansas, at Marymount College. It's no longer open. A little small Catholic school, uh, and it doesn't. So it doesn't really matter where you go to school. It only matters really kind of what you want to do. I mean, people always say, "So, so does it? Does it really hurt you that you're living in in, in Kansas?" You know. And it's like, no, it doesn't really hurt me because it's not where you live, it's what you're doing. You know, I, I'm well, living here, I'm not distracted by all the gobbledygook talk in, in Hollywood about, hey, you know, it's the talking dog movie's the hot movie right now, you know? <laughs> if you got a talking dog movie script, because the talking dog movie, everybody wants a talking dog movie right now. You should be working on a talking dog movie, because talking dog movies are. They're just, they're, you know, they're, everybody's just dying for them. <laughs> so I don't hear any of that stuff. So I live in my own little cocoon where I get to work on the things that I care about, that, that, that I, that stories that I believe in, that, that I love. And it's taken me a long time to get here. Uh, you know, it's, that, these things don't happen overnight. But, um, but this is, this was my way of kind of sharing my truth. And when you when you get hired to do a project, when I, like I recently wrote um, a movie about Arthur Ashe, the tennis player. And so this is this is where my job is to really kind of take his story and uh, evaluate it, adapt it, uh, and then find the truth of who Arthur Ashe is and was. And 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 find the most dramatic elements of that story and place it in the screenplay, and hopefully that will be a, a really good film. And so, in the end, you're always dealing with truth. And so, you've got to kind of think about truth yourself. You kind of got to know your own truth. What's what's true to you? What what you believe in? What what you think is important? What what you care about? And then you kind of try to find a way to give that point of view connected to whatever story you're writing. And it's the, it's the kind of mixture of the two of those things, of, of your, own, your own vision, your own truth, your own understanding of the world with the facts and the realities of someone else's life, of someone else's story. And, and, and so people always say, well, you know, how do you, how do you adapt? Um, for instance, Black Clansman. Um, let's let's show the trailer of Black Clansman, and I'll, I'll talk about adapting it because it's a it's a great example of kind of how you know you take a story that you know is really good but isn't necessarily a movie in some ways, and how you turn it into.
never been a black cop in this city. We think you might be the man to open things up around here. Jews, Mexicans, and Irish, Italians, and Chinese. But my mouth to God's ears, I really hate those black rats. And anyone else, really, that doesn't have pure white Aryan blood running through their veins. I'm happy to talk about pure white America. God bless white America. <laughs> the KKK is planning an attack. How do you propose to make this investigation? Well, establish contact over the phone. We'll need a white officer to play me when they meet face to face. Do you feel the white race trying to go on now? So it becomes a combined onslaught. Can you do that? With the right white man, you can do anything. <laughs> When's the last time they let a rookie be the best of your shit? Oh, that's right. Never. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Become his friend. Let's get invited back. What kind of stuff are you guys doing? Cross burdens, marches, delicious fiction. It'll be a big year for us. You can ask too many questions. Are you undercover or something? <laughs> So, uh, Ron Stallworth's book uh, is a great book, uh, and Ron Stallworth was a really good policeman. Uh, and him being a really good policeman, uh, there's no third act in the book because he solved the crime. And so, um, that was one of the big kind of challenges to adapting the book into the movie because the, there was really no third act. And so what actually happened was that the Klan was going to blow up a, a gay nightclub in Colorado Springs. And that really wasn't our story. So one of the things you learn in adapting is that you're looking for what's kind of, in screenwriting, kind of called a controlling idea, which is the, the theme, the big theme of the movie. And for me, the big theme of the movie was, was Tunis. And Tunis is, uh, was a concept that was kind of, I think, first coined by W.E.B. Du Bois. And Tunis, he said, he said, black people are, are black and American. And, and he called it two warring factions in one dark body. And that probably one of the best examples that you know, we can relate to today is that it's like when, when George Floyd's killed. When George Floyd's murdered by the police, you know, he's a black man, and black people look at that, and they go, that's so wrong that they killed this black man like that. And then they're also American, and they're looking at George Floyd being murdered like that, and they're going like, now is America gonna do anything about that? Is America going to not just solve this crime, but prevent police from killing people like George Floyd? And so those are the two warring factions, being black and being an American. And, and these, these two factions are always kind of fighting each other because oftentimes America lets us down. And so, so you know, black people, I would argue, are, are probably more American than anybody because we believed in America when America didn't believe in us. I mean, you know, growing up in Junction City, the Buffalo Soldiers, those men fought in World War II, they fought in Korea, they fought in Vietnam. They had no rights when they came back home. So they were willing to believe in the concept of America with the hope that 
I'm going to extend myself to America and then America will come back and, 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 and fulfill its promise to me. And, and so that's kind of the tunis thing is, is probably the most defining, that's what the boy said, it was the, that's, the, that's the defining thing in, in black American life was this tunis, this tunis problem. And so in black plans, there's a lot of tunis in black plans. Uh, and so there's tunis with Ron Stallworth. Obviously there's two Ron Stallworths. So there's tunis right there. There's a black Ron Stallworth and a white Ron Stallworth. So you got tunis there. Then you got a black Ron Stallworth and his girlfriend who hates the police. So he's got a black and blue problem. He's black and he's also blue. So that's another Tunis issue that he's got. He loves being a policeman and, and militants are, hate the police because of George Floyd. And then you've got uh, the Adam Driver character who's, who's white and Jewish. And he has kind of abandoned his Jewish self and now he's infiltrated the Klan, and he's hearing this anti-Semitic stuff every day. And it's forced him to come to terms with his Jewish self. So his tunis is at work here. So he's white and he's Jewish, but he's buried his Jewish self, and now he can't bury it anymore because the Klan is put in his face every second of the day. Uh, and so, uh, and so that's, that's the tunis thing. And that's the that's really the conflict that is going on in the film, you know. That can Ron Stallworth kind of navigate through this whole maze of tunis to kind of you know solve the crime, you know. Uh, and you know I have to tell you, so David Duke, when the movie premiered, David Duke called Ron Stallworth, and he asked how he was portrayed in the film. And it's like, dude, you're a clansman. How do you think you're portrayed in the film? <laughs> Come on, man, right? Um, and so the Tunis thing is, um, you know, a big part of I think black life still today, uh, and but it was all through kind of black clansmen. And so adapting it was finding that that kind of uh, glue to kind of hold all the choices together was the thing that kind of really made the movie work. You know, in many ways, you know, the, the last act, you know, where Harry Belafonte shows up. And so what I did was I just took the lynching of Jesse Washington, who was a real man who was lynched in Waco, Texas during the turn of the century. Uh, and, you know, we knew that, you know, we didn't know Harry Belafonte would, would play the role. Uh, but we, I, I was hoping he would get somebody like that. And so he's, he's a witness to this lynching. So I took the details of the lynching and then I put it through Perry Belfonte's character as being someone who witnessed the lynching. And so that's where you take, you take the real history, you take the real events, and then you dramatize them. So, you know, people always say, the book is always better than the movie. And the reason they say that is because they're two entirely different things. Books are books and movies are movies. And so when I have to take a movie and a book and turn it into a movie, I have to, I have to change a lot of stuff because the book is, is a book. You know? And a book works like a book works. Like, you know, you can have a hundred pages about visiting the Sphinx in, 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 in Egypt. That's gonna be two minutes in the movie. Because guess what? Nobody wants to see a movie where the dude say, man, this thing is just so damn cool. Wow. Isn't it cool? Yeah, it's cool, man. It's cool. Yeah, wow. It's cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so that's the way it works. You have to take those things and you've got to turn it into a screenplay. And so, uh, so, but it all starts kind of with the truth element to it that truth thing of, you know, if I had not found the Tunis element of it, that was really the truth about 
this kind of situation. And you're looking at the entire situation of the book, not just one event, but the entire situation, and you're looking for a metaphor that can really express the entire situation of the book. And, and then when you find that, then you're now in control of the material. So before the book kind of controls you, you're trying to find a metaphor that where you can kind of harness the book and now control it and turn it into a movie that you, that you want to see. You see how that works? And, and so the, the controlling idea is really critical because um, most adaptations that fail, I would argue, they didn't figure out the controlling idea. They didn't figure out the theme. Because it really all starts with that because the theme kind of tells you what to keep in and what to cut out. Uh, one of the hardest things about adapting movies, and really kind of one of the hardest things about writing movies, is you have a million ideas in your head. You got all these things you want to say. And you can't say all those things in a movie. So how do you whittle them down? What, what, how do you define things and get them to kind of hone them down into one idea? And, and really, a movie has to kind of be one big idea. If you're looking for a metaphor, that's a big enough idea to handle all of that. So for me, that's been kind of the history of, of you know, finding my own truth, of, of finding, trying to find a way to express it, trying to find a way to um, make a living at it. Um, I was able to find a way to do it kind of on my terms. You know, I, I never, when I sold my first screenplay, I sold my first screenplay, I wrote it with my buddy, Mitch Bryan. It was about John Brown, the abolitionist. It was a big sale. We sold a 20th century box. It's like, wow, it's like a miracle. I always told my friends, I said, I was the last slave that John Brown freed. <laughs> and, and, and I had not been to LA at that time when I sold the script. So I, even when I sold the screenplay, I didn't have to be in LA. So the whole notion that you have to go there, you don't have to go there. What you have to have is something they want. It's, especially now, I mean, because of COVID, I'm, I'm on Zooms with these people all the time. No one's in LA now. They're all in, in their home in Montana and they're their home in Connecticut and their home in some damn place. Because guess what? Nobody really wants to live in LA. But <laughs> don't get that around. You've been on the freeway in LA? You know the deal, right? So, so COVID has kind of, Zoom has freed everyone from having to, and the big question now is what are they gonna do with these damn big office buildings they have, right? Because no one wants to go back to those, but that's a whole, that's a whole other lecture right there. Um, but to me, I could open up to questions, uh, comments from you. Yeah. First of all, thank you. This has been wonderful. And I really enjoyed hearing what you had to share with us and feel like I've learned a lot. Um, I work with books a lot. I write. Do you write books? I mean, I know that's like, why, why would you need to? But <laughs> because you're doing all this in another uh, media that is wonderful, and I enjoy the films um, that you've given us. But I'm wondering if you write too with the idea of books and whether, uh, how that plays out for you. Sure. Well, guys like you who know how to write books, I mean, my hat, my hat goes off to you because <laughs> You know, books are, are a whole other thing than screenplays. Um, you know, the screenplay is the blueprint to, to make the film. And, and a book is real literature. I mean, you know, it's that, that joke about the Egypt, you know, is if you're a really good writer, you're gonna, you can write 100 pages about visiting the Sphinx, and I'm, and I'm gonna be fascinated with all 100 pages. I'm not that dude. I mean, and, and I'm not that guy probably because, um, I guess because of growing up, just wanting to be involved with movies as a kid. And, and so I really kind of told stories as a kid 
I didn't know what a screenplay was, but I was writing stories like they were a screenplay. And so I, I went to college to learn how to write screenplays. And so that, that so that's kind of, you know, I've, I've kind of, I, I, you know, people have approached me about that, but I, it, it's such a different kind of writing uh, that I probably would have to come back to the school and, and, <laughs> and learn how to do that. But uh, uh, so yeah, I, pro I probably won't be doing that, no. Hi, um, hey. my name is Chris, I'm a screenwriter student here um, at Washburn. And I first of all just wanna thank you for coming and sharing your stories and everything's been very inspiring. Um, I have a question. I'm working on, um, in my class, working on a spec script for, um, I'm working on a historical drama. And one of the things that I um, wonder with you is when you when you stumble across some piece of history like you did for the 24th, do you have like a ratio in mind in your, in your head, like this is how much of the history I want to preserve for the film or in my script? Um, versus how much I'm gonna bring in my own historical, or sorry, uh, dr dramatical sure. um, retellings of it so that I can you know, make it for the screen? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, kind of, kind of the way it works for me anyway, everybody's kind of, kind of got their own way of doing it, but how it works for me is that, um, you know, you when you first look at an event, or like, you know, like Black Klansman, which is real, a real story, I mean, so it's a historical event, really. Uh, and so I get the book, and I go through the book, and I'm looking for all the conflict. I'm looking for all the trauma. I'm looking for all the conflict. So I go through it, and I highlight all the, all the trauma, all the conflict. And, um, and, you know, movies are three acts, so you're kind of seeing kind of how these events can, can really kind of fall into that three-act screenwriting structure. But what you quickly kind of learn, once you look at what you have to work with from the book or from the historical event, is that, you know, there's just a lot of drama that you still needed. And so I always try to rely on the history as much as possible. So I, I go back and, and if I, I don't want to change history at all if I don't have to. Uh, typically, what I'll do is um, really select a story where I don't have to change the history much. So the 24th, um, you know, you know, I, it's a it's a fictional kind of world that they're in, but it's all detailed from the actual events and all from the actual kind of characters that were involved in it, uh, and so. That, 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 that for me kind of gives me assurance that it's real and it's true. The more I can, the more I can kind of connect to the actual history, it gives me confidence that I'm telling the true story. And what I mean by the true story is that, that it's good drama, it's important drama. It is it's something that I'm not just doing anything I want to do to it. Plus it's also respectful to the history. You know, you have to, I mean, it's not a documentary. Documentaries have to be totally respectful to the history. I mean, documentaries are a document that I'm showing sure It's a document. That's not what feature films do. That's not what narrative movies do. Narrative movies, you know, you've got to balance that thing you're talking about, that ratio you're talking about is the balance between the history and the entertainment. So you have to, you have to do things to hold the audience as well. You have to do things that you know are entertaining choices that have sometimes, you know, you want to base those choices out of things that would have occurred from this world. So you're not just pulling something out of a hat, just just has nothing to do with the world of the movie. For instance, in the in the 24th, we have this dance scene in the 24th. And uh, and it's a fun scene, and it's early in the movie, and it shows kind of the community of the soldiers and the community, the black community in, in Houston, and you know, and it's an upper, you know? And so I know that I got a lot of bad stuff that's coming in the third act. So I need some upper early in the movies because 
that keeps the audience and makes the audience invest in the characters. You know, if you know, a lot of movies work really fast now. What I mean by that, they just take off and, and they don't spend much time where you get to learn who the main character is and where they're from and who they are and some of the other people, and because I think they believe that our attention span is just not there anymore. And I, I don't I don't want to believe that fully. I mean, it's a balancing act, and that's the thing you're talking about. So you've got to balance all of these things. You know, the, the history, the, the entertainment, the, the drama that you've got to make up to make it work. So like in Black Klansman, I didn't make up the whole third act because it, you know, the, the gay nightclub wouldn't work. So we, we turned it into uh, the Black Student Union and I brought in the Harry Belafonte character and, uh, and that was our movie, that's our story. And then I thought about, I actually kind of thought about a bad Clint Eastwood movie, uh, Magnum Force, where they had a bomb in, this, in that movie. It was kind of a mad bomber kind of dude in that movie, and uh, and that movie kind of made me think about, because it's a 70s movie also, and I thought about, I could use this bomb thing, and so that was that was kind of how, so it's a weird combination of all these things, you know, but in the end, you should feel confident with the choices you're making. You know, the choices you make should kind of rest some of your fears, some of your insecurities, so when you when you when you're making you're making choices, not just for the story, you're also making choices for yourself. You're making choices that you know I can I can write this well. I can this makes sense to me. I understand this. I'm gonna I I can write this. Make those choices rather than th things outside yourself that maybe you don't write as well, maybe you don't understand as much. That's that's one of the big ones. So, Professor Wilmot, uh, given where you started this talk, it's been 32 years since 9th Street, and, and I know you got a couple other irons in the fire, so why don't you finish those six or eight or ten projects? Um, especially given the fact that your, two of your recent films have also focused on African American soldiers as a key theme. Have you thought about coming back to Junction City? <laughs> that's, so, that's so funny that you say that, Tom. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, my, the, the next movie I want to make is about the story I just told you guys. It's about it's about getting thrown out of school and the whole the whole deal. And um, and there's another element to that story. It was my buddy. I had a buddy that I grew up with. His name was, was his name was Bobby Earl Taylor. And uh, and he, you know, and there was a young girl that it was in our neighborhood. And one of the things in, in Junction City was so crazy back then, uh, because it's an army town and prostitution was, was you know, was just everywhere. And uh, in fact, um, my mother ran a pool hall on Ninth Street, and and we had what was called a tr two trick babies that lived with us for a year. And trick babies are the children of a prostitute. From a John, so they're called because that's that's a trick when a, a prostitute does a trick. That's you know, and then but she had these two children, and and they were they lived with us in our in our house for a year, and my mother knew her from Ninth Street, and my mother told me she said she's a prostitute and these are these babies are trick babies, and but you will not judge her. And, and that, that, whole, that whole thing of learning not to judge people uh, kind of was one of the governing kind of, kind of approaches to my whole life. And everything I kind of write about, that whole thing she taught me about not judging people. So, uh, so yeah, that's, so there was a young woman, young girl, I was a high, we were in high school together, and we lost girls to become prostitutes in high school all the time. So, you know, you, you would be going to the movies and you look across the street and there's one of your classmates on the corner, a prostitute. And, uh, and that was, you know, what I think about now was totally normal then. 
It was totally normal. It was not shocking at all. It was shocking to us, but not in the way it should be shocking. It's more shocking to me now when I think about it. You know, when I'm writing about it, it's like, man, you know, it's like, so one of, one, one, one of our friends uh, ended up on the corner. Uh, and my buddy Bobby Earl and me, we all went to the black exploitation movies together. And then she ended up on the corner. And Bobby Earl and me went out to her on the corner and tried to get her off the corner. And literally, we, we tried and grabbed her, and we were trying to get her off the corner. And there was her, her pimp was across the street. And, and we didn't know it, but about a year later, my friend was killed here in Topeka by the pimp. And he was getting ready to kill me and Bobby at that time, too. And we didn't know. We found that out later. So, um, and the, the hard thing about telling that story has been, I don't want her to be a victim. I don't want, because she was so much more than that. She was, she was a young girl, a beautiful young woman with a great future ahead of her, who was victim of the education system, was victim of a lot of different things. And bad parents, just, you know, the whole nine yards. And so, um, so I'm telling that story in the midst of this love we had for those black exploitation movies. So literally, we go see The Mac, which is about a pimp, and we walk outside and the pimp would be right outside the theater. And we go see Superfly, and you'd go see Superfly, and you'd walk outside, and there's a guy in a Superfly suit right outside the theater. And, and, it, and it was such a crazy, cool time. Um, there was a place called the, the Motown Record Shop in Junction. It was a little bitty joint. And, you could, and, and they had 45s, you remember 45s, you know. You go buy your 45s there. And, and, the, and the, one of our classmates, <laughs> she didn't run it, but she worked there. And, she, and they would make eight track tapes for you. So any eight track, you could pick out eight songs for like $7. And I remember my, one of my buddies said, that's, that's against the law, right? And she said, oh yeah. <laughs> and, and so, you know, and then, then like a couple years later, I remember my buddy Bobby, you know, I have this in the script. When he, when he came back and, and we drove by in the, in the Motown where the shop was closed, he said, yeah, you know, Motown, you can't use Motown's name without their permission. You, you, did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and somebody dropped a dime on him for making those, those bootleg A-track tapes and, you know. But that was, that was, that was the beauty of those times, and, uh, but also the, the tragedy of them as well. So, so I'm hoping to. And you know, I'd say it, but so far I've not been able to find a lot of support for the for that story in Hollywood. And so I'm gonna make that for a while. But that way I don't have to listen to her gobble goop too. So yeah. that's just what she's doing. Hello, um, my question is about the not 
Hiroshi, the 24th, they end up killing some innocent people. There's not, there's a lot of complexity to this stuff. There's not, it's just an even, you get to be the hero or the bad guy. This is, and this is the thing that makes it a little harder to sell in Hollywood as well. You know, most movies from their point of view have to be really easy to, to digest. They're making movies for everyone. You, know, you see what I'm saying? They make they want the movie to be to go all over the world, and 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 it, you know they want it to translate in every language. That's why Arnold Schwarzenegger was such a big star for a long time because he didn't have any lines in movies, <laughs> and the ones that he had were easily good. I'll be back. You know, it's like <laughs> yeah, we can translate that, dude. No problem. You know? So so you're trying to find you're trying to find um, some actors that might. Give you some, 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 some push. You know when you get ready to sell it. Um, some movies are easy to sell than others. A horror movie is a lot easier to sell than a drama. Dramas are probably the hardest movies to get made. Drama, I mean, just you know, just dramas, because they're they're sometimes they're they're kind of downers. And so anything that's kind of a downer is is going to be hard to get made. Hello. Hey. Thanks for coming. I uh, had seen some of these first time attending. I went to the Miracle of Innocence Gala a couple of years ago, well, last year, and uh, you spoke there, and I'm, I, I'm starting to follow you now. <laughs> Here, here's my dilemma. I'm involved, or have been involved, with a couple of uh, three lawsuits. I'm the plaintiff in all of them. Uh, for whatever reason, the newspapers will not cover these stories based on who's involved as I keep track of one of the oldest cases from 1997 in Johnson County. Uh, I follow it and follow it and follow it. And when you go back and look in the file, uh, stuff has been admitted into the case after the case is over, mm. under seal. Wow. So now I'm trying to get that stuff released from under seal. And now all of a sudden the file has been copied and destroyed. The file is no longer active. It, it's legally, it, they say it's destroyed. So when they ask them what destroyed means, they say, well, it's gone. Mm -hmm. It's on microfilm somewhere. Wow. But they don't know where. Uh, these stories, to me, everything you said tonight, I can almost quote exactly my case. Wow. I was born and raised in Leavenworth, Kansas, graduated in 1970. So I know all about that, that stigma and that, that era. Uh, I was a wrestler, so I got away with a, one incident that I shouldn't have. Right. Looking back, I shouldn't have, but I was, based on being a state champion and all that kind of crap, you know, but that's the way the system is, and I have always, always, always fought the system. You try to do right, but when you get involved with the legal system and you get these big time attorneys that will fight you, I had to do all my stuff exactly by the book. Wow. If they filed that paperwork out of work, out of order, out of time, and I filed them, uh, paperwork, uh, they kick it out. So I'm just saying, uh, History has a way of repeating itself. Mm -hmm. When the Kansas City Star came out with their rebuttal, after all these years in J.C. Nichols Parkway down in Kansas City, uh, they finally acknowledged that, hey, things have been wrong for the black people for quite some time. Uh, and I'd like to say I'm part of that story too. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> well, you know, the, the beautiful thing about what you said, sir, is that and and you know I'm glad you're you're fighting to get that information. Um, you know that's 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 the thing that documentaries can do. That you know I mean that's one of the for, for again for young filmmakers. There's a lot of stories like this gentleman's story right here, and they need people that will take the time. See, it takes time to tell his story correctly. One of the big elements of telling someone's story like this is the research it takes to find those things that have been buried and, and deleted and all of that stuff. And but that stuff is probably there somewhere, but you, it's they don't they don't want you to find it. So you gotta you gotta you gotta you gotta learn how to find it. And those learning those kind of skills will will kind of you know give you a leg up in the industry anywhere you go.
because let me tell you, anybody making documentaries, if you if you can research someone's case like this and find the information he's looking for, then that same kind, those same techniques and those same kind of skills can be applied to any story that HBO or Showtime, because there are, you see there's a lot of documentaries on those channels now, and they're important documentaries, and they're often about controversial things that have been buried a long time ago. And so, you know, learning those skills now with a case like this, I really want to encourage you to, to think about that because, you know, these, these are opportunities. These are, op this is what I'm saying about you can, you can take on something like this and you'll find more support for it and you'll find resources for it. And, you know, the Innocence Project in Kansas City is, uh, is a great project because it's, you know, innocent people being sent to prison for a huge amount of time and then they say, oh, I guess he is innocent. And then you get out, and then you got to restart your life, and you try to get some, you know, restitution for all this prison time you've done unfairly. And so these are these are always great stories. Thank you. Hey, well, related, kind of related to uh, to that question. Uh, can you give us an idea about how much research that you do? Uh, because a lot of your projects are historically based. Uh, how much research uh, do, you, so do you end up doing until you kind of get to a until you get to a point where you kind of feel like it's re the script's ready? Sure. Yeah. Well, research is 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 critical, but it, I call it targeted research. So when you when you're writing something like Black Klansman, um, so you have a book, but then then you're also kind of, there are things in the book that are mentioned that aren't expanded upon. And so, for instance, uh, Stokely Carmichael was, was mentioned in the book, and he's a, a character in the film. And, um, but we did not know that the book didn't mention that his name, he changed his name. And so, uh, and so we, we, that was a cool little addition that we found. And, um, and, Basically, the targeted research is that once you kind of know what your movie's about, try to find as much information as you can about just that. Don't, what I mean is you want to find this information, not this information. Because this information actually can end up hurting you as a writer. Because you just get bogged down in information and, you, and it's not targeted. It's not, it's not the information you need for the story you're trying to tell. You need information about the story you're trying to tell. Not, not just everything about this subject, but the information that you're trying to tell. And so the more you get into telling that story, the more it's revealed exactly what information you need. And that's where you research that. That's what you go and try to find. And that's, and that's also kind of how you eventually know when you found enough information because when you, when you reach the point in the story that dramatically it seems fulfilled and you've got the information that you feel confident now to tell the story. That's the thing, again, I was talking about, you know, you know research should give you confidence. Confidence that I'm, that I'm in my head, I'm in the world of this event. I'm in the world of this character. I'm in the world of these things that I'm writing about, that, that you feel like you, you're, you're a participant in it. That's how you should feel. And, and when you feel that way, writing is about feeling. So much of it's about a feeling that you have. And for me, the details of those events make me believe I'm there more. When I write the details out, then I believe, oh man, yeah, this is, this is the world of, of that movie. This is the world of the movie. And then I see a photograph, and I see those details in a photograph, and then I believe even more that this is the world of the movie. So, so details are really important. Research is great because you'll find things in research, crazy cool things that, that are dramatic things that you lift, and you, it's, all that stuff's free, you know? <laughs> Nobody owns that history. You know, except you, and you use it. So, 
So, you know, just research it and, and detail it. And, but the big thing is don't, don't swamp yourself in information because then you end up being bogged down and, and oftentimes it stops you from writing. So that's, that's something to really avoid. Hi, my name is Russ. I hey, Russ. How are you doing? Um, my cousin was Dr. Danny. Oh, so wow. We had that conversation at, yeah. Yeah, at Marymount. Um, on a lighter note, <clears throat> during the NCAA tournament, I saw a commercial called Chuck U. And it was with Charles Barkley yeah. and Spike Lee yeah. Yeah. and Samuel Jackson. But I didn't see you. And I was wondering if you could explain what happened there. <laughs> well, you know, they don't call me, man. They don't call me. What is, what is up? What's up? What's up? What's up with that, right? Uh, I have to tell you, his, uh, it's your, uh, uh, your cousin? Uh, yeah. Your cousin, Dr. Denny, Dr. Dennis Denny, was my mentor at Marymount College. And uh, he really taught me screenwriting. And, and playwriting, and I wrote the play Night Street in his class, and that play got me into NYU film school. And so, you know, uh, he was a, you know, that's the thing about, about, you know, the whole thing about New York and LA and and that stuff is that, you know, I found so many opportunities. A, a schools like Washburn are such great schools because, you know, if you can if you can channel the resources here to your advantage, and then go do something that you want to do with the resources that they have here, that's that's what going to school is about using their stuff. <laughs> that's what going to school is about. You go you go to school with an agenda. I want to make a film. I want to write plays, I want to do plays, I want to write movies, whatever your thing is, go there and then use their stuff. That's what you're paying for. And then use their stuff, and then that's your resume when you leave. The movies you make when you're here, that's your resume. That's what no one has ever asked for my degree, ever in my life. But they asked to see the script, they asked to see the movie, so that's that's the thing that you want to do. You want to make you want to make something when you're here. Best thing I ever did was making Ninth Street when I was an undergrad. That movie, that play, got me into graduate school, and then that was the first movie I made, and and it was something I cared about. So when you're writing a story and you're really focusing on, you know, those important truths that can be like heavy at times, how do you kind of balance getting the important parts of those messages across while still kind of holding on to that hope and kind of keeping your head above water? Yeah, that's 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 a good one. Um, I think a, a large part of this stuff about ownership that I talk about owning owning history is also kind of about when you're which is kind of, kind of, you know, you have to find a way to own pain. Not just your own personal pain, but the, the pain of society. The pain of, the pain of people you're writing about. The pain of the, the, whatever the story is. And, and you've got to kind of breathe that pain in, and you've also got to be in control of the pain and be able to use the pain to express it so that other people can understand someone else's pain. So it's a it's a dual kind of thing again, where you got to you got to feel it yourself, and you can't be afraid to feel it. I mean, that's kind of one of the things that gives you confidence about about you know I'm on the right track. This is I'm I'm doing something I think that's right. You can't let the pain take over. You can't start. You can't just let it kind of just you know take over because then that will also kind of derail your writing. You know, it's a weird balancing act between kind of feeling it and then expressing it. The reason to feel it is to express it better. It's not just to feel it for feeling's sake. It is a feeling it to express it better. So, so if you can, um, you know, kind of go there and and then learn from that pain and learn from someone else's pain 
connected to your own pain because that, that, that's the element that makes you know you're expressing it correctly. Because you're feeling it the way you think they maybe felt it too. So that just gives you confidence again. And then you can go on and do what you need to do. It's a weird little thing. You had to take that. I think a lot of times writers, especially young writers, avoid that part of it. And the more you do it, the easier it is, you know, it's never easy, but you know, but the more accustomed you become to it. Uh, hi, I'm, hey. I'm, I'm Aiden, I'm, gonna, um, I'm an aspiring writer director here at Washburn. Um, and you mentioned a few bits and pieces about how to get your feet off the ground, uh, like getting an actor, um, if you're the kids. Um, what other advice could you give um, to people trying to get your feet off the ground? Well, um, I think the one of the big ones is also, uh, especially with movies, um, you can't make a movie by yourself. You have to you have to have a team of people, and that's what's great about going to, you know, the, all the young people I met, you and, and your classmates. I mean, you know, that's a team. That's 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 a crew. You have a crew there, so it's a crew to make a film. So if you have a script that's really good, one of the things that I specifically always try to do with the independent films I've made is I try to write stories based on what I had access to. I didn't write movies like, like my Egypt joke, and then we go to Egypt. <laughs> you know, I can't get to Egypt. So, you know, I've got to make choices based in what I have around me. And you have to make entertaining choices based on what you have around you. So it's not just what you have, it's also entertaining choices. You ultimately are an entertainer. You're an entertainer. You can't forget that part of it. You're an entertainer. If somebody's got to watch this when it's done, and you want to laugh, you want to cry, you've got to be compelled, you've got to hold the audience, all that stuff. So, so if you can find with your crew, your fellow students, and the students are great because, you know, when you leave school, you're all trying to be filmmakers still, so you can work outside of graduation. And I mean, I've, I've got students that had created partnerships in school, and they're still working together 20 years later. So, so those kind of things, that's, that's, a, that's a big one because that allows you to have someone to kind of learn from, to grow from, to suffer with, to go through all the ups and downs of all the stuff that's going to happen to you. Let me tell you, I've had some ups and downs, brother. Uh, but I've also always had people to go through this. And so I never felt like it was by myself. It was always other people, other friends, partners that was going through the things with you. And I don't know, no filmmaker, you know, every filmmaker that becomes a director had to go make their movie. When, when you leave school, you gotta go make your movie. And then, and you know, I made my first film, Ninth Street, and I didn't get a lot of love with that film. And then I made the CSA. The best piece of advice I got was after I made Ninth Street, I was talking to one of the Hudlin brothers. We had a screening of my film in Planet Hollywood in New York. And I said, so what should I do now? He said, make another one. And I made CSA. And, and then that got into the Sundance. And that's how I met Spike Lee. So Spike Lee called me, I ain't called Spike Lee. I made a movie, Spike Lee saw the movie, he called me. So the power of getting it done, making your film, getting it out there, they call you, you don't have to, people would always, when I was trying to first get my movie, you should get to Oprah. Get to Oprah. Yeah. Get to Spike. Get to, there's all these names. It's like, they don't want to talk to you. <laughs> you know, they, you have to do something. You have to make your movie. When you make your movie, then you got something. You got a, you got a, you, it goes back to choice of weapons. You got a weapon now. You got something that people want. They're going to want to see your movie. People are going to want to see it. I mean, distributors are going to want to see it. They may turn you down, but they're going to want to see it because you might have the next boom, and they don't want to miss that. 
So if you got the next boom, then you're you're not. When I got into Sundance, like about a hundred agents called me. First, when that movie's announced, they're on you like white on rice, and 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 you're you're the hot thing for about two days, and 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 so you got the attention then, but. To get the attention, you got to get a movie that gets in the Sundance, and that's not an easy thing. But but with your friends and you know in your community, you get it done. Hello, uh, hey. my name is Victor. Um, I'll be graduating uh, this May with the film degree here at Washburn. Um, so I guess my first question is. Uh, do you have any job opportunities? <laughs> <laughs> I'm hiring. I'm hiring. Okay. Maybe, maybe next summer. Maybe next summer, sir. Okay. Maybe next summer. No, I guess my real question is um, just being a Mexican American here in Kansas. Um, I guess telling stories about what I want to tell yeah. is very vital. And, sure. Um, I guess dealing it, no offense, here at Washburn is deciding on whether to give up my integrity, I guess, of what I want to actually do to actually just get the job done and hopefully get more money to fund my stuff. Um, could you tell us a little bit about any of your stories or journeys about having to give up um, something that you so deeply wanted to do just yeah. for the greater good of it? Well, you know, um, you know, I had kids when I was, you know, making my movies and, um, and you have to, it's a balancing act. And you have to, you know, you have to just always make sure you're always working on your thing. You know, one of the first lessons I had when I had kids was that uh, if you try to avoid taking care of your kids, you're never gonna get anything done. <laughs> so you have to embrace the responsibility. By embracing the responsibility of your kids, it gives you the freedom to do your work. Avoiding responsibility actually screws you up in, try, in terms of trying to do your work. And so I, I, I kind of take that principle and that principle applies to a lot more than just kids. So, so when you're out there trying to get it done to then do your thing, think of it as a bank. Whatever, when, I mean, I, I call it thinking man's work. I would take jobs, you know, uh, I worked at, you know, Rex's OK Tire, and you're changing tires, because I could do that and not and still be thinking about my movie. So the minute I got done with work, I ran home and I got on my typewriter, because all day I'm thinking about my movie, and I took I took jobs that I could think. I call it thinking man's work. Yeah, one of the great jobs is pushing a broom. If you push a broom, you can be thinking about what you want to think about. Office work is a little shady, because they kind of want stuff from you. <laughs> so you, so you, you, can't, you can't just be off in your own little orbit somewhere. They go, yeah, he's in his orbit again. Get him out of here, you know? Uh, so you have to kind of, so the, the, my, big, my big point to, to your thing is, is spend time figuring out what your thing is. Find out exactly what it is. Uh, and then do whatever it needs to take, whatever you need to do to make sure you keep working on it. Sometimes you're gonna be working on it less, sometimes you're gonna be working on it more. And so what I mean by that is your other, op your other obligations, your other raising the money for it, Whatever you gotta do is gonna be taking time away from that, but that's okay as long as you always make time for it. And, and you utilize your time you know, to your advantage. I mean, you only have so much time a day because of you may have to have a job, you gotta do whatever you gotta do. But when you got that spirit, when you got your time, you're doing that. And that means I never got to hang out with my buddies. My, my behind was in the seat, I was writing. So if your behind's not in the seat, you're not right. You can't be right. You can't write while you're hanging out with fellas. So you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta do what it takes, and that means you gotta be really disciplined, and 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 you. Gotta
got to work really hard, and you've got to be willing to be disappointed. I've had, I've, I just saw one of my old rejection letters the other day, and my, my hometown, Georgia City, turned down my plate 9th Street. They wouldn't do my plate 9th Street in my hometown. And you know what I did? I produced it myself. I went to the high school, I rented the high school, I produced the plate myself, and I cleaned up. <laughs> So, so, you know, when people say no to you, no's are some of the best things in life because you don't have to get bitter about it, you don't have to get mad about it. Just keep working and then do the thing that you know you gotta do. You got one more? Sure. Uh, my name's Eric, I'm a film student here at Washburn. I just thank you for your time here today and everything. Sure. This has been awesome hearing you. Uh, so my question is involving writing. I like um, directing and I don't feel of myself as a strong writer, so what kind of advice could you give a, a writer that's kind of struggling with writing and then also where do you pull inspiration from? Sure, sure. Well, um, you know, that's good that you know that, that you're not a strong writer. Uh, don't write. <laughs> Get somebody that's a writer. I mean, that's that's the thing that I kind of learned from, from Dr. Denny again, was that I only I only tried out for the lead in the play one time because I didn't think I was right for the lead. I mean, so you have to be honest with yourself. You have to be honest about your opportunities. It's like I don't I'm not gonna just try out for the lead because that's the lead I want to be the dude. If I'm not right for the part, I tried out for the play, I, the part I thought I was right for, that I could do a really good job with. And I always got those parts. And then people who saw the play, they man, you're really good. Because I knew I wasn't going to be good at that dude over there. I'm gonna be, I'll be good here, but I'm not that guy. And so knowing, knowing who you are, huge. Because it takes more than a writer-director to make a movie. It takes, again, it takes a whole crew of people. So if you're if you're a good director, then then find a writer. Producing is producing the things you need to make the film. That's what producers will do. They produce the things you need to make the film. So producers are going to say, hey, you know, my man over here, he's a great writer. So I got a great script for you to direct. That's that's what a producer does. <laughs> you know? And, and then one of your other classmates is a really good cinematographer, and they're serious about being a cinematographer. Dan, you got a cinematographer. And so, so it's, a producer is the person that puts all the pieces together. A high tide raises all boats. So everybody benefits from you kind of, your project. If you say, I want to make a film, and then you go out looking for a script, everybody, the brother, will be out there trying to work with you. And more than likely, you can get their script for no money because they're looking for an opportunity. So when you make your first films, you don't have a lot of money, so you can't, you, know, you just can't be paying people all over. People have to work for free because they're trying to build a resume. So when you get the film made, the writer is gonna thank you. If you make him look good, you make his writing look good, he's gonna thank you because that's the only way he's, his writing's gonna ever come to life. And now you're a director because you directed the film. And the producer student over here now has a producing credit and they know how to produce now. So when you do decide to go to New York, LA, or Chicago, wherever you want to go, or stay here, you've actually been doing it. It's not a concept anymore. And you really can't get good at making movies until you make them. You really can't become a good writer until you make a film and then you learn film time by seeing kind of how time works in a movie. And so there's a lot of things like that that just you benefit from just doing it. So, and it doesn't matter if the movie's great or not. It doesn't matter. It just matters that you're doing it. You know, nobody just made one film and it's like, oh my God, the next season will be the mill. Most folks don't even know who that dude is now, but, uh, but you see what I'm saying. You only get good by doing it. And you have to do more than one movie. You have to do as many as you can all the time. You should be making movies all the time. No one has an excuse now. Everybody's got a movie camera on their phone. You know? 
And so when you got a movie camera on your phone, you gotta do it. Thank you. Oh, very cool, man. Thank you, bro. Good to see you, man. I already said it. 